Okay, good morning, good morning. Happy Friday. So I've passed the test back. You guys can look at them after class, but for right now, we're going to start on page 49. So open up to page 49, and we'll just mention a, a couple of things about the test, just generally speaking. I think that the third test of this semester is the hardest test of this semester, including the final that you guys are going to take in about two weeks. I think that the topics, some of the most challenging topics of the entire semester are right there between tests two and three. We talked about families of functions and related rates and optimization problems and everything kind of came to its conclusion between tests two and three. So I think that test number three is the toughest one of the semester. That said, I think that the final exam is also going to be challenging, but maybe for a different reason. The final exam is going to be cumulative. So it's going to be hard because of the quantity of things that you need to refresh your memory about. Uh, but the goal of the final exam is not to focus on the little detail things that we've been thinking about throughout the semester, but rather big picture stuff. So in some sense, final exam will be easier because it's not going to be so focused on many, many challenging topics, but it will be cumulative. So it's going to have a lot of uh, breadth to it. So um, the median grade on the exam was 78 and the mean was 75. And um, so that just gives you a sense of, uh, of what your peers did on this test. Uh, I'm happy to, um, to play the what if game with you guys, which uh, it means that you can come up to me after class and say, hey, Ian, what do I need to get on the final in order to keep an A or to get a B or to get up to a C? And, and we can really like hone in and we can figure out what interval you have you know, like to have a goal for on the final exam. So see me after class or during office hours, really any time, and we can just uh, really get an, a good sense of what you need to do on the final to get such and such a grade. Chris? Go over the number uh, grade-wise to go into the next class? Yeah, can I go? Oh, what do you need to continue on? Right. Yes, so uh, in order to get credit for this class uh, in terms of a degree requirement, you need a D, which is a 63%. In order to continue to, to calculus two, you need to do better. You need a C minus, and for me, a C minus is at 69.5. Okay. All right, so here's what the remaining classes look like, and there aren't many of them. We have uh, velocity and total distance. We'll talk about that today. And then we have three classes next week where we introduce the idea of the integral, which segues very nicely into next semester. And then Monday, the following week, is the last day of the semester, the last day of classes. And that's going to be our review day. And then our exam is on Thursday the 20th, two weeks from yesterday. So there is, what's happening here? Uh, there is a project, which I will pass out. Uh, the project is not due until the actual um, exam. Joe, do you mind putting like six of those on every table? Thank you. So we're assigning the project. It's the last project of the semester. It's not a math project per se. It's going to be a lot of writing and thinking and reflecting about your, your time in this course. Um, the grade that you get on this project is not going to be about uh, how much you compliment or insult the course or my teaching of the course. The grade is going to be based on how reflective you are. So just do some honest thinking about the past semester and what you've accomplished, and you'll get an A. I mean, this is this project right here has the highest grade average for me of all the projects. Many, many people get 100. You just have to show me that you spent some time thinking about what you've done this semester, OK? So that project is due um, when you come to the final exam. If you get it done early, super, hand it in early, and you have less things to worry about during that very challenging week of exams. And then on Friday next week is our ninth and final quiz, OK? Thank you, Joe. Any questions on any of this? OK, so let's come back here to page 49. And we'll go up here to the top. And can we go to who's ready on 49? Abby, go ahead. OK, so the question above is the name of this section, is how do we measure distance travel? And that's the goal for today. Let's go to Richard. Are you ready on 49?
Okay, so I don't know if you guys remember, but way, way, way back, right before we started talking about the derivative, we had this zombie race. And the graphs that I gave you had time on the horizontal axis, just like it is here, but the vertical axis was distance traveled, was where these zombies were on the race course at a certain amount of time. I don't know if you guys remember, like one of them uh, was like this, starting there, and then, you know, straight line up to the top. Another one was starting here, this, and then this, and then this. Do you guys remember? This was distance way back, way, way back. And then you guys analyzed a lot of stuff about velocity. So now we're doing kind of the opposite direction. I'm giving you velocity, and we're going to try to figure out distance traveled. So you have four graphs there. There's a whole slew of questions here, and it continues on to the next page. Your goal is to, well, essentially your goal is to get to this bold thing right here in your groups. But if a group finishes quickly, then just keep on keeping on, okay? So um, because there are five single tables, we're going to ask people to shuffle around. So move to a table with at least one other person at it and see how far you guys can get on this activity. Okay, so uh, I think we made some real good progress on this group activity and uh, finished in various places, but there are a few conclusions that I really want to make sure that, um, that we get at the end of today. So the first thing is, um, why was it easy to figure out the total distance traveled for Feynman? Because it was a constant velocity, and so we get to use our favorite, most basic of physics formulas, distance is rate times time, and that's fine as long as the rate is constant. But if the rate isn't constant, like down here with Planck, then we can't just do a simple distance is equal to rate times time. So what we do is we'll just assume that Planck was doing constant velocities for small periods of time. And so how about we just look at the first half hour between zero and half. What was the fastest that Planck was traveling during that interval? It was three miles an hour. So let's just assume that he was traveling at three miles an hour for the entire half hour, okay? And if it's a constant velocity during that period, I can use my favorite distance is equal to rate times time. And I just want to point out a geometric thing here. The rate is this height right here. Yes, the rate is three. And the time is this width down here. And so if I just complete it to a rectangle, then distance equals rate times time corresponds to area equals length times width or height times width, okay? And so that was the magical leap between all of a sudden we went from distances rate times time to finding the area of a rectangle. Same formula, okay? Uh, if instead I wanted to underestimate in the same half hour, what was the slowest that Planck was going in this half hour? Roughly two. So what you do is you take the 0 0.5, you go up to wherever, I think I might have missed it, but we go up to there and assume that he was traveling at that speed the whole time so that to complete the rectangle is going this way, okay? And I'd really like to make sure you guys get practice over the weekend with drawing left rectangles and right rectangles. The word, so uh, the green here was the left and the red there was the, the right rectangle. I completely sent that backwards. The red is the left and the green was the right. And what we're saying there is um, we're describing which point you pick on the interval. Between 0 and 0 0.5, if you want a left rectangle, you pick the left-hand point. That was what we did with the red. You pick the left-hand point, which was here. You went up to the curve and just assumed that was what was happening the whole time. If you want a right estimate, you go to the interval. You pick the right-hand point up to the curve and assume that was the, the constant the whole time. Okay? So it's a little bit counterintuitive, maybe, for right rectangles. Where, which way do you draw once you find the height? You draw to the left. Right, so that's not, we're not describing which way you draw. We're describing which point do you pick of your two choices, okay? Left rectangle, pick the left point. All right, so that is that. And then on the next page, two pages down the road, uh, we had our conclusion here. So can somebody share with us their conclusion? Yeah, for number eight. Perfect. Yes? That's it. That's the highlight. And I understand that um, that you guys, in uh, if you're in physics, that you talked about area under a curve maybe a month ago or something. 
Somebody mentioned that. <laughs> Briefly. And you guys just... <laughs> right, so it was just take an integral, and we don't know what an integral is, but Mathematica can turn out the calculations. Well, all right, so here's why the area under the velocity curve is the distance. It's exactly what you guys did today. Okay, another conclusion, uh, um, uh, another, yeah, something else I'd like you to take away from today, and I know not everybody was able to finish this, but I gave a picture, and actually made a typo in this picture. This should be feet per second over here, so it matches the stuff in the table. So you can do exactly the same thing from this graph. You can draw some left estimates, some left rectangles. You can draw some right rectangles. If you haven't done that, I'd encourage you to do that later. Draw however many, six, six left rectangles. Draw six right rectangles, and, um, and just make sure you can draw them. So I'd like you to be able to estimate the area uh, under the curve from looking at a picture, but I'd also like you to be able to estimate the area under the curve by looking at a table. If you have the picture, you just draw your rectangles and estimate the height. If you have the table, you imagine, oh, there's a picture that this came from, and all I need to do is grab the numbers off of the table. So for example, in the first interval, 0 to 10, if I want a left rectangle, which point am I picking, the 0 or the 10? I'm picking the, if we want a left rectangle, we pick the 0. So a left rectangle, we pick that number right there. That is the height of that rectangle. And you can see here in the picture, the height of this very first rectangle, 35. Right? And what do you multiply that thing by to find the distance traveled there? You multiply by the 10 seconds that passed. Okay? And if I wanted to go to, say, this pair of points and I want a right rectangle, which point do we pick, the 40 or the 50? You pick the 50, the right rectangle, you pick the right-hand point. So the height we're assuming in that rectangle is what number? If you're picking the height based on the 50, then you are picking the 84 as your height. And again, what's the width of that rectangle? It's still 10. Between 40 and 50 is 10. OK. So I'd like you to be able to do area under a curve from a graph. I'd also like you to be able to do it from a table. If I just give you a table and you really need to see the graph until you're comfortable, just draw a graph, plot some points, and draw the graph. And at some point, you'll say, oh, all right, we can just grab the numbers from the table. All right, on the next page, things get a little bit notation heavy. So let's go to number four, and we'll go to uh, Garrett. Okay, so uh, we've got a velocity curve right here. Reminds us of the curvy thing we looked at a, a couple of them today, Planck's one, for example. Um, and at the moment, we're going to make the velocity non-negative, although it could be negative if the person were going backwards. Right? But let's just assume for right now it's non-negative. And we've got some interval A to B. That's the time interval, starting from one hour into the race and ending five hours into the race, something like that. We're going to cut this interval not into five pieces like you did on some of them, not into ten pieces like you did on some of them, but into some generic number of pieces, n pieces. Right? It's going to get notationally heavy because we're making the leap between a specific ten rectangles and a more general n rectangles. But it's probably worth writing. n is the number of rectangles. That is our notation. So can be confusing because there are a lot of symbols that are going to be flying around, but n is always the same thing. It always represents the same thing. It's the number of rectangles. So we cut it into n equal pieces, and so that gives us a bunch of different values for time. And we're just going to call these things t0, t1, t2, t3, t4. In the Planck example, your times were 0, 0.5 hours, 1 hour, 1.5 hours, 2 hours. Okay, So those things we're just going to call the t's. And then, uh, next one. We're going to find the width of each of these intervals. Okay. If we did the, the Planck one, which went from zero to five hours, and we did ten intervals in there, that's what you guys did, right? How long is each interval? How wide is each interval? It was how much? You guys did half-hour intervals, right? 
So let's see if we can figure out why was it half. All right, so Tiffany gave us the first clue. It was really 5 divided by 10. Why was it 5 divided by 10? Well, what was 10 in the example? It was the number of intervals, which is the same as the number of rectangles. Right? Every interval gets a rectangle. And then uh, why was it 5 in this case? Yeah, 5 was the total time that passed. Yeah. What if we instead went from 1 to 5? How much time has passed there? It's 4 hours. So it's really 5 minus 0. The starting number was 0. So if we're going to try this in general, okay, how much time has passed going from the starting time of A and the ending time of B is B minus A. Divided by the number of rectangles, the number of intervals is N. So that formula right there tells you the width of each of your rectangles. And so our symbol for width is going to be delta T, supposed to remind you of a change in time, half an hour. OK. And then we're going to write down some crazy symbols here. We're going to approximate the total distance traveled by left-hand sum or right-hand sum, not necessarily always over-underestimating or always underestimating, just consistently pick the left-hand point in each interval. OK, so in the first interval, what is the left-hand point? Is it T0 or T1? It's T0. So you're going to pick T0. You're going to go up to the graph. You're going to draw your rectangle like that. Yes? And how would you find the height? Well, you're just plugging T0 into the function. So f of T0. Whoa. OK, so f of T0 is the height of the first one. What's the width? It's T1 minus T0, but if we're assuming it's the same width all the time, well, we gave a name to it. It's the delta T. So that delta T is the width times F of T0 is the height. In the next interval, what's the left-hand point, T1 or T2? It's T1. So you go to T1, you go up to the curve. To find that number, I'm just doing F of T1. Then I go over and I draw the rest of my rectangle. And so here's f of t1 is the height. Delta t is still the width. It's the same width all the way throughout, just to make it easier. And you just keep going. And then as you get to the very end, what is the last left-hand point? It's tn minus 1. If you're doing left-hand points, you never get to see the right-hand number. The, the, the last number never gets looked at. So this guy stops at tn minus 1. Same calculation, add them all up. That estimates our distance. The only modification when you're doing a right-hand sum in the first interval, which is the right-hand point, is T1, which means you'll never see which number, the T0. So you can see that T0, which was the starting guy here, does not appear here. You start at T1, and then T2, and then all the way to the end. Again, right-hand point, which is the one on the right in the last interval, is Tn. So we do get to see the Tn. That was the one number we didn't get to see here. So all we're doing is trading. One number comes into the picture and one number disappears. And you add them all up and you get um, you get this crazy looking complicated thing. I do think there's some funny notation stuff happening in your on your page. I don't know why it changed all my deltas into capital D's, but there's more, more typo stuff. OK, and then the last thing for today is um, that uh, in this picture, the velocity is positive in the beginning, but then velocity is negative at some point below the t-axis. So the person is moving backwards. You're still going to find areas. You can still find the area down here, for example. But what kind of a number are you going to call it? You're going to call it a negative. Uh, yeah, it is out of the range of this problem. Yeah, but anything below the axis, we're still going to call it area, but you have to know that it, it needs to be a negative number. Right? Areas are always positive, but if we're finding distance traveled or um, you know, how far you are from the start, you got to treat those as negatives. Okay. All right. Uh, sorry for going over. The homework is in the usual place. Again, uh, I'm happy to play the what-if game uh, at some point. Could be now. Could be uh, next week, anytime. I also have the answer key for the test, so I'll just leave it up here if anybody wants to look at it. And have a wonderful weekend.